for this Easter to uh, talk about what that means for us, what that is, and how we celebrate, and what exactly we're celebrating. Because um, for a while, I'm not going to lie, I was very focused on the Easter and how it lays eggs. I have no idea how that happened. That's all I focused on in Easter, was how that happened. So today we'll talk about what exactly that is and what that means for us. So for those who don't know, first of all, uh, my name is Miguel. Uh, but for those who don't know, Easter, what exactly that means. So for us and most of the world, what that means is to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And what we're doing is throughout this weekend, we're going through this journey of him being led to the cross, the Last Supper, being betrayed, being crucified. And then, spoiler, he rises, right? And he pays the price so that we don't have to. So that's what this weekend is about, is us remembering that. And... Um, it's kind of nice because it's one, it's one of the few holidays, you can say, uh, or, or weekends, the world comes together and kind of takes a day off and remembers something. Now, what they remember or what they do on the day off, up to them. But one time we're like, yeah, yeah, it's Jesus. Jesus is on everyone's mind, whether it's questioning who he is, whether it's knowing who he is, whatever it is, Jesus is the central focus of this weekend, right? And you may be wondering, Miguel, what does bunnies have to do with Jesus? I have no idea. Um, so I did what any logical person would do, what any studious person, uh, collegiate <clears throat> study of the word would do, is I went to the most powerful search engine we have, tool that we have in this universe, the 21st century. Google. I went to Google. Yeah. And uh, I said, okay, listen, I ha I ha how do I word this correctly so I don't get any of those spam articles of like a... What's it called? Uh, BuzzFeed articles are like, what Easter means or what he means of Jesus, right? I was like, how do I word it correctly so that they know I'm, I'm serious about this? <clears throat> so I went to my computer. I was like, what's the deal with bunnies and Jesus? What's the deal? I have no idea what bunny and Jesus have to do with each other. So that's what I looked up, and I'm sure, of course, articles came up. And um, some, some are pretty good, some are pretty educational, and the others, uh, it was just a lot of stuff, a lot of words. I just read the pictures, that's all I did. So out of, out of our hours and hours of reading articles and uh, watching YouTube videos and going down rabbit holes, no pun intended, um, I found out that there really is no connection. Um, what happened was back in the day, the early church uh, did what we're doing now. They took this weekend to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his journey to the cross, the price he paid for us, and then him being risen. That was a central focus. And then later on, uh, years and years later, a pagan group came, basically those who serve a different god. And they came and they said, hey, listen, to us, for us, bunnies represent fertility and newness of life and renewal of life. That's our god, and that's what we worship. So you guys are worshiping this Jesus dude, right? And how he has a newness of life. He rose to, you know, from dead. And it sounds pretty similar. Why don't we just, uh, you know? And that's kind of what happened. They kind of got merged together, and people kind of lose the focus of what it means. Honestly, I'm sure it can be innocent, and it's pretty fun. For me, it was really fun uh, finding the Easter eggs uh, whenever we did those. And I did one not too long ago, a couple years ago, actually. And I got money. Like, the older you get, the more, like, treasure gets, right? When I, when I was first, uh, you know, when I was younger, it was just chocolate, and that was exciting. <laughs> I wouldn't, like, wait till I was done. I would just kind of take it, put the chocolate in my hand, put the egg, eat it, another one eat it. And then my mom's like, where's the chocolate? And I was like, these ones didn't have chocolate. It's just found the empty eggs. Maybe you forgot to put them in there, you know? <laughs> so that was fun. But then the older you get, it's like you open one and it's like an M&M. You're like, oh, cool. And the next one, it's like $20. And you're like, what? <laughs> whoa, when did this happen, right? Or like, it's like a dollar and you're like, even this is fine, you know? Back in the day, it was like a Redbox movie for a dollar, right? Like, this is insane. This is getting pretty intense. So like, the older you get, the more and more intense it gets. So I'm sure this is fun. But we have to remember what the main theme is for this weekend, and that's to focus on the resurrection of Jesus and what that means for us. And then we'll go find the eggs later, right? So that's what we're focusing on today, and we're going to get there. We're going to get to that story of the resurrection of that weekend, but first we're going to take a scenic route. We're going to get there, and we're going to show another story in the Bible that mirrors the same story of Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, for those who have been joining us and know we're, we're, what series we're on, we're on the series of the names of God. And we're going over other, each name of 
God in the Bible and what that means, and basically what characteristic he shows. So that when we pray, when we call upon Jesus and God, we know exactly who we're talking to and what that means for us. So we're going to our favorite Bible character, Abraham. Every time I come up here, we're talking about Abraham, and we're going back to him. We're going to Genesis chapter 14, and we're going to read about that. Today, our name is El Elyon. That's the name we're going over today, El Elyon, the God Most High. The God Most High, El Elyon. And I just thank God this name happened to fall on this weekend because it just falls perfectly. It falls perfectly with who God is, what the story means for us. The God Most High. I'm excited. I um, hope you are. But before we go into Genesis chapter 14, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this Easter weekend, Lord, the time where we can come together and focus on you and the gift that you gave us, Lord, the resurrection, being risen from the grave, Lord, but also the journey that you took to get there. Lord, as you carried the cross to the hill, Lord, as people mocked you, Lord, and they, and they spit on you, Lord, you did all these things and you saw us and you said we're worth it. Let us uh, open the word and let your spirit be in this room. Let it be your word spoken and not mine. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, Genesis chapter 14. Uh, get there. It's pretty, pretty uh, hard to find. It's the first book in the Bible, 14n. So as you're getting there, I'm going to give you some backstory. So the first 12 verses, I don't know if you're there or not, but the first 12 verses just look like a lot of names. And it is. It's a lot of names, a lot of kingdoms. Very confusing. So I'm going to summarize it for you because I make it easy for you. And then we'll get into the good stuff later. So for the first 12 verses of Genesis chapter 14, what's happening is that Abraham's life, this is before the covenant, before any, any promises are made, so far, Abraham has only moved to Egypt. That's what God's told him to do. And then the whole Sarah pretending to be a sister thing happened like a few chapters ago. And this is where he's at right now. So Genesis chapter 14, the first 12 verses, there's nine kingdoms living under one government right now. Nine kingdoms. And about the 12th year, they're in this, you know, this cycle. They're thinking to themselves, five of them are saying, I don't want to do this anymore. This leadership, whack. I don't want to do it. It's bad. Bad leadership. I want to move. I want to get out of here. So then the five of them are, are, are kind of conspiring against each other and saying, hey, listen, these four feel like they don't want to do it. And us five. So then this is the, four, the 12th year. The 13th year, the both sides are kind of hearing what's happening. They're hearing murmurs and rumors. Like, what's going on? Are we going to split? Are we going to keep on the same government? And then the 14th year is where we're entering right now in this chapter. The other remaining four kingdoms were like, hey, wait a minute. Are you trying to break off from this government that we're doing good in? No. So then the four went against the five and conquered each kingdom. All five of them, just four of them, beat the other five. And then within this uh, conflict, a lot, this is Abraham's nephew, just so happened to be in the mix of what's happening. Uh, and the war between these four kingdoms, Lot gets stuck in this. He gets caught in the drama. So for those who know, um, Lot is Abraham's nephew. And a few chapters ago, Lot and Abraham were splitting lands. They had so much in between them. They're like, hey, listen, so that our servants don't like, you know, get mad at each other, let's just split up. You pick one land and I'll pick one land. So Lot saw land that was fruitful, it looked great. It was on the Jordan. And he's like, I'll take this. And Abraham took the other land. But where Lot went was near the town of Sodom. Now, for those who know the town of Sodom, eventually it grew to be so wicked that it had to be destroyed. But this is just the beginning. So Lot was like, we'll just live here. And that's why he's in this mess. So he gets caught in this mess because Sodom was captured. Sodom was part of those um, five kingdoms that was captured. And Lot gets caught in between those. Lot gets captured in all of his goods. In some versions, it says all of his gods. Because already, Lot being in Sodom started slowly drifting away from the God that Abraham was serving. He says his goods and his gods were taken from him. So that's where we are. Um, we're caught up now. So let's read verse 14 of chapter 14. It says, When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Verse 15, During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as as Hobah, north of Damascus. Let's pause there. Excuse me, what? 318 trained men. 
Who are these trained men? What are they doing? They're going against this kingdom, these, these four kingdoms who are on a winning streak of beating kingdoms. Who are these 318 men? So as I was reading this, I saw two different kinds of scenarios going on. I saw one really cool scenario where Abram is a well-seasoned 75-year-old man. He's 75 right now in the story. And he realizes that he has so much possession. He has all these good things that he doesn't want it to be taken over, to be conquered, to be messed with. So everyone that comes to his camp, whether they're his family, whether they're his servants, he trains them, saying, listen, we have so much. You, know, you, can, you can build whatever family you want. But we're going to train so that we wouldn't lose these things, so that you know how to protect your family, your gifts, your possessions. I don't know about you, but it sounds like a pretty cool introduction of like a war story, right? The 75-year-old seasoned man training these farmers, these nobodies, 318 men, to just be ready for anything. That sounds pretty cool. And then on the other hand, I was reading this, this is some crazy 75-year-old uncle who finds out his nephew is taken captive, and he's like, listen, you 318, we're going to get him. My family is captured, and nothing's stopping me. We're going to get my nephew. Either one of those stories are insane, because 318 men versus, let's say, 12,000. Each tribe has 3,000 soldiers. That's 12,000. 318 versus 12,000. How is that possible? No matter what their background is, no matter what their training is, there's just 318, lack of a better word, farmers going against these soldiers. So Abraham sees his nephew in trouble, and he goes to save him. So like I said before, this group of people, these uh, four kingdoms, are on a winning streak. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I succeed in life or... Um, I win like a sports game or a video game or whatever. It feels good. I was like, ah, <laughs> I just beat like this level, right? I feel pretty good. Or like I go to a sports game and my team won. Okay, <laughs> I feel pretty good, right? Or I went this, got this promotion. I'm saying it beforehand, so when pastor comes, tell them I got a promotion. Okay. <laughs> so like I got a promotion. I'm feeling pretty good, right? Ah, feels good. So like the, the more and more these things are happening in your life. Like the bigger, like you stand up different, you're, you puff out your chest, you feel different, you carry yourself differently, right? The more and more good things happening to you. So let's just say, hypothetically, not really, it's in the Bible, there are five kingdoms that are rebelling against you. You and your three other kingdoms, four kingdoms. And you're like, hey, listen, I don't like what you're saying. And you defeat each kingdom. The first one, you feel good. The second one, hey, we're pretty good. We can probably do this. The third one, no one can stop us. The next two, just as easy. So these four kingdoms are going off and they're beating the other five easily. So imagine you're one of the 318 farmers and you see this confident, adrenaline-rushed group of men, kingdom men. How would you feel? Because, you know, people carry themselves differently, right? You can see it. These guys look pretty confident. They're probably not even worried about what's happening. They're like, oh, 318, it's not even a quarter of the armies that we, we, we battle. Easy, easy money. So <clears throat> my brother and I are pretty close in age, and we played um, a lot together when we were younger because we lived together. And my brother loved video games. And um, so for me in my generation, the old the oldest station we had was the PlayStation 1. I know that's probably not even old, but for me, it was. So we had the PlayStation 1, and we would play uh, like racing games. That's all they had then it was racing games and like uh, Tetris and stuff like that. So we were playing those games, and my brother's brain worked differently. Now, that's bad, but <laughs> what that means is that whenever he played video games, something clicked in his mind. He just got it right away. I don't know about anybody who kind of get that, or those who feel the opposite way with like the new technology. You're like, <laughs> I don't know. Can I call? Can I text? That's all that matters, right? So my brother just knew automatically this made sense, and he would progress further than I would easily in these games. I'm like, what? How? So when I was, I didn't really get get that. I didn't get that he worked differently and that he would just progress further. 
And he's always been that way. He's been smarter. He knows math. He went super far in math. I don't, I don't know what that means. But he just, he just gets it in his brain. He just gets it, right? So when I was in that age with him, I was like, oh, this is what makes sense to me. We're both the same age. This game is new to both of us. We should both be on the same level, right? Yeah, that should make sense. No. My brother, uh, he would, he would, because he would get it, and I would give up, like, the hours I'd give up, I was gone for maybe one hour. I'm like, oh, I'm going to take a break because I lost, like, five in a row whatever. I'm going to go take a break. And I come back, and this man has, like, either beaten the game or, like, is rewiring it, whatever he's doing. But he's progressed so much further. In that one hour, I was gone. And I would get, um, let's just say, a little frustrated. And being the youngest sibling, I would do what any youngest sibling would do in the cause of unfairness and in times of distress. I cried. <laughs> I cried so loud that I made sure it would cross the two other rooms so my parents could hear. It was like a mixture of like crying, whining, but like, it's like, is he getting beat up right now? Like, I don't know what the, what the crying is. But I'd cry loud enough so my parents could hear me in whatever room they were in. And then they would yell at my brother, like, hey, listen, quit beating him. Just let him win, right? And then I would win. And listen, 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 listen. Okay. When people ask if you won a game, they don't ask how you won. They just ask if you won. So I won, okay? That's all that matters. Um, I would win af after my, um, my uh, skill set to get what I want. Um, I would win, and my brother would let me win, and then after rounds and rounds, I'm like, oh, I'm actually getting pretty good at this. I think, I think I'm good. And then I would win the next round, and I'm like, oh, maybe it's not just him letting me win anymore. Maybe I'm getting pretty good. And then I would win the next round, and then I would think, hey, I think I'm getting good at this game. And then I would win the next one, and then as I'm thinking, am I better than my brother? he would put in the tiniest effort and beat me again. And then the cycle would repeat. I was nowhere near. He was just letting me win, just to make me feel good. But I felt so good. I was like, why? This guy knows nothing. <laughs> knows nothing. I came in here, now I know everything. But that's not how it worked. He just let me win. But that's how these armies are feeling. They just conquered five different nations, kingdoms. Their chests are puffed up. They're like, I got this. I'm on a winning streak. Who are these 318 farmers? So this is what it feels like. This is what's going on. Now what's scary and what's different and unique about these farmer men is that they were going back family and nothing was going to stop them. Abram was going for his nephew and nothing was going to stop him. Our first point today is that Jesus will drop everything to come back and save you, his family. Jesus did come back to save you, his family. Jesus saw the mistake in the garden. He saw the choice that they made. And he said, I can't, make, I can't let that happen. They're, they're losing. Our distance is becoming greater and greater. That can't happen. I need to save them. So he came down as humble as he could, and he began that journey. He saw that choice and he said, no, I can't let my family be lost. I need them. So let's move on. Verse 16, it says, he recovered all the goods and brought back his relative lot and his possessions together with them and the other people. So you mean to tell me that a 75-year-old man and 318 farmers just went in at night and captured Lot. I mean, got back Lot and, and all of his possessions. And it says people, the woman and the other people, even more people. And he brought them back to safety. Do those sound like good odds to you? 318 versus 12,000. Are they good or no? They're not good odds, right? Well, isn't it good that we see what we see as uneven and impossible, God sees as conquered and possible. Amen. The odds we see aren't the odds he sees. Amen? What we see chains, Jesus sees freedom. Where we see failure, Jesus sees victory. 
Where we see death, Jesus sees life. Jesus is life. In that tomb, we saw death. In that tomb, we saw Jesus go in and die, crucified. That was the end. That's what we thought. The odds weren't in our favor. That was it. He came down to save us, and now he's gone. But it was in that moment, in that Sabbath as he rested, is where most of the work, the important things came in. It got crazy. So if you feel like right now you're caught in that crossfire where you feel like Lot, and you think, there's no way I can stop drinking that drink, taking those pills, looking at those things in the computer. There's no way I can financially get out of this hole. There's no way that I can do these things. There's no way I can get back to where I was with Jesus. I want to tell you that there is. And Jesus is that way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those are three solutions right there in that sentence. He's the way. He's the truth, and he's the life. And he fulfilled that as he was here. Abraham sent 318 men to get his nephew Lot, including him, 319. God sent one for you. And that was enough. When the odds looked like they weren't going to happen, one was enough. Jesus was enough. He sent El Elyon, the God Most High, sent his own son. And no matter where you might find yourself in, whatever hole you're in, whatever obstacle you think is in the way, he made a way out. So let's keep reading. Verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, El Elyon. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So I mentioned earlier in this timeline, this is before Abram and God had any kind of real um, covenant promise. God spoke to Abraham in chapter 12 and told him to go to Egypt. And he did. He listened. He trusted him. But this is before anything big happens. He, he told him in chapter 12, kind of briefly, you know, you'll be a father of nations. But that's kind of in passing. And Abraham so trusted him. And then this guy, Melchizedek, he's a king and a priest. He says, I don't know if you realize who was with you, but that was El Elyon, God Most High. That was the only reason that you were successful in this. Maybe you don't know it, but I can see it. I can see who was with you fighting that battle. So our second point today is that even when we don't see it, others can see God fighting with you. Even when we don't see it, others can see it. That time where we feel confident, we're puffing up our chest, walking up straight. God just blessed us. God got us out of this hole that we're in. God answered that prayer. Maybe not the way we wanted. He still answered that prayer. People notice. You carry yourself differently, and people notice. You might not know this, but the reason you made it past this, people can say, there's something different about you. There's someone with you doing things in the background. It's the only way you made it through this. How is this possible? How can you have peace in the storm that you're in? How can you be so loving to others who are mocking you? There has to be something going on. And you could tell them there is. There's El Elyon, the God most high, with me. That's why. That's what's different. Jesus was led to the cross that Friday afternoon and later was laid in the grave. The next day, the Sabbath, disciples, and Mary, and everyone who cared for him and loved him were in mourning. They were scared. They were even fearful. So much had happened in that, on that Friday. People were betraying him. People were loving him. People were beating on him. And they're trying to take that all in on that Sabbath, that day of rest, thinking, what's going to happen Next, is there a plan? What are we going to do now? Our best friend, our leader, our shepherd is gone. What's going to happen? 
and is their plan. What they didn't see is that in that moment, in that tomb, the preparation for what was about to happen for the rest of our lives was bigger than they could ever imagine. The plan that was taking place, the battle that was being fought, was bigger than they could ever imagine. If Jesus was going to raise from that dead, from dead, the grip that death had on us was going to be free. That sin, the penalty that we had, was going to be let go. But they didn't know yet. They were asking God, what's the plan? What's going to happen? Just because we don't see it doesn't mean God isn't working. God was definitely with them, and they saw that later on. Let's finish this story. Uh, Verse 21, it says, The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or a strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me. To Aner, Eshko, and Mem, let them have their share. As the king was praising Abram on his victory that he just had, he said, listen, keep the goods for yourself. You did a good thing. You just captured your, your nephew. You did an amazing thing. Abram finally got into his mind what Melchizedek was saying. He said, you're right. To El Elyon, to God Most High was with me. And if he just did this thing, 318 men, it's not recorded if he lost anyone. So it's still safe to say that he had all these men back with him. If I can go save my family and come back to safety, I can trust this God with my possessions. I don't need anything. My faith is strong enough. Listen, you keep your stuff, but for me, and he quotes Melchizedek. He says, with raised hand, hand high, I swore an oath to the God most high, creator of heaven and earth. He repeated what Melchizedek said. He said, I know who I'm with now. I know who's fighting with me now. The God most high. With this, I'm not going to take anything because he will provide for me. He said, not even a thread, not even a thread or a strap to a sandal. But notice what he does at the end of this verse. His three other friends that went with him, Aner, Eshko, and Mame, he said, let them have their share. In our journeys in life, we might be at a, at a station in our life where we have the freedom and the peace and the faith to rely on God fully. That's where we should be. That's amazing. But realize, remember, it took you a while to get there. You had to go through certain things, right? You had to trust him in the small things, and then to the next thing, and then to the next thing. Abram realized that. This isn't the first time he faced something like this. So he says, for my three other friends, let them take what they need to take. Let them have their possessions. They're not there yet, and that's okay. He didn't hold them from their possessions. He said, if they need things, let them take it. But for me, what I went through, I know the God I serve. And through my life, I'll teach them that he will provide for me. He didn't withhold them from what they needed, but he showed them a life fully committed to El Elyon, the God most high. There's nothing that Abram could have done more of or less of for God to be with him. For El Elyon, the God Most High, to be with him in that journey of saving his family. There's nothing he could have done, more or less. Him taking those possessions didn't even make him more sightful, more treasureful, if that's a word. I don't know if it's a word. But he didn't need to take that. Some of us think that if we succeed in life, if we have more of this money, if we have more of these things, maybe God will be pleased with me. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll make it worth it. Maybe I'll see myself as worthy and God will bless me. Abram just proved that you don't need that. Abram just proved that all we need is God most high. It took him a while to get there, but when he got it, 
He lived a life to what he lived through. He lived through this one thing, and he continued to live through it. He didn't go back. He made mistakes, sure, but he continued serving El Elyon. He was enough, and church family, you are enough. There's nothing more you need to do. Nothing more you need to gain. Nothing you need to do or be. Jesus sees you as enough to be the God most high to you. You're enough. So we were a lot like Lot. We're caught in this battle between Lucifer and God. And Lucifer is trying to prove a point that I can be like El Elyon. I can be like the Most High. I can do what he does. And we're caught in the middle. And as the dust was settled, Jesus looked and he saw us helpless, in bondage, lost, needing help. And he said, I'm going back to save them. That's my family. They need to come home. This can't happen, and I need to save my family. Jesus saw us like Lot, and he said, you're worth it for me to come down and save you. So there's this family, there's a story of this family. <clears throat> it's a mother and a father and a daughter. The daughter is going through um, chemotherapy. She has a cancer, and she's in her teenage years between 14 and 16, I don't remember what, how exactly old, but she's very young. She's going through chemo. And this isn't the first time. They're about halfway through their, um, their visits, and they're used to the routine. They go in. The daughter gets changed. They pull into her room, and they're there for a few hours, and they go through their medication. And the mom and the father sit outside in the waiting room, or they take turns watching the daughter. So at this moment, the mother is just sitting in the waiting room and thinking to herself of all these possibilities of what's going to happen. They need to pay bills. They need to pay for housing, for food, and then the chemo bills on top of that. She's thinking about all these things, and her husband's there with her. She's like, okay, I need to take a break. I need to get my mind off things. And she goes to the hallway, and she's trying to find a vending machine. Now, in this hospital, each level has a vending machine, and then right next to it, there's a machine to pay your parking. If you feel like your meter is going to expire, you can just put in your license plate number, put some money, and you can send your hours. So she's walking there, and she's just thinking about all these things, about paying bills, and then she's like, okay, what should I get from the vending machine? And she gets there, and as soon as she gets there, she's looking at the items in the vending machine, a man steps next to her, and he's you know, going through his pockets of thinking of trying to find his wallet to pay his parking meter. And he makes this sigh. He's like, ah, man. And the woman's like, oh, what's wrong? Are you okay? He's like, yeah, I just forgot my wallet um, downstairs, and I want to go all the way down to come back up. My meter's about to expire, and they'll just ticket me. And she's like, oh, okay. And um, he said, I'm sorry to bother you, but do you have just $5? I can, I'll pay you after my shift is over. Now this man was pretty, pretty well, 6'2", slim, had a suit on, looked like he took care of himself. She said, okay, I'll trust him. And she's like, yeah, sure, I can help you with that. So she opens up her wallet, and as she's opening up her wallet, the man looks down and sees as she opens up her wallet, the only thing in that wallet was the $5 bill. She takes it out, and she gives it to him. He's like, I hope this, you know, this works. He's like, yeah, yeah, thank you. He's like, thank you so much. So he puts it in, puts his license plate number. And before she leaves, she's, about, she's walking back to the waiting, the waiting room. And he's like, before you leave, what's your name? And she says, my name's Sarah. He's like, thank you so much, Sarah. I promise to pay you back. So she goes back to the waiting room. And she sits down next to her husband. And his husband is just thinking to himself, she didn't have you know, any food. Maybe she was too focused on what's going on with their daughter's life and these bills. There's a lot going on. So he didn't, want to, he didn't want to mention anything. He just asked her, are you okay? She said, yeah, I'm okay. I just helped someone out, but I'm okay. 
So their daughter comes out of their chemotherapy appointment. Um, she's in a wheelchair, and their mom and the daughter and the, hu and the husband are pushing her to the elevator, and they go down. And as they're going down, before they exit the main lobby, the mom realizes, oh, before we leave, we have to go to the secretary's office and talk about how we can finance things. If we should sign up for scholarship, for, for financial help, and how we can you know, deduct these bills and you know, pay this forward. We need to go talk to her before we leave so we can have some kind of answer. So they go down to the secretary, and um, the, the mom goes to the secretary. She's like, hey, you know, my name's Sarah. This is my daughter. We're trying to figure out our billing statements. She's like, Sarah. She's like, yeah, that's, that's my name. She's like, Do you, did you happen to be on this floor? She's like, yeah. She's like, oh, you're Sarah. And the mom was very confused. She's like, yeah, I, it's me, I'm Sarah. She's like, I'm sorry, but can I figure out how to pay these bills? She's very focused on what she needed to do and could have really get what the secretary was saying. She's like, I want to pay for today's appointment or figure out how we can extend this and pay it in different amounts. And the secretary says, oh, he didn't tell you. And the mom says, what do you mean? Your appointment today was paid in full. And the mom gasped, like, what, what do you mean, who paid in full? She said, well, the CEO of the hospital. She's like, the CEO of the hospital? I don't know the CEO of the hospital. And she's like, you don't have to. He knows you. And she's like, and she, she begins to cry out of joy and confusion. And she's like, thank you, God, for answering prayer. And then she's like, okay, I'm sorry, but before I leave, can I figure out the rest of our bills? Because we still have, you know, this one's paid for, but we need the ones before and after. She was like, no, 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 you don't get it. Your bill is paid in full. The ones you took before and the ones you're going to take after. The CEO added your name to his list so that every appointment you have in this hospital is paid in full. You don't have to know who he is, but he knows who you are. And the mom, Sarah, finally connected the dots of who, he, who she just met in that hallway. In the act of giving her her every, everything, he paid back in an amount that could never establish, never could match up to what she could ever do for him. But her bill was paid. Her bill was paid in full. Mark 15, verse 17. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. In the mocking of our Savior, he looked up and he said, You are enough. As he carried the cross to the hill where they would crucify him, he saw the mistakes you made and the mistakes you were going to make. And he said, you are worth it. As our sins nailed him on the cross, he took the penalty so that we wouldn't have to. Our third point today is that it's nothing you did or have to do for Jesus to love you. Jesus knows who you are. Before you meet him in the hallway, he knows who you are. Your bill is paid in full. And finally, John 19. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus finally on the cross, hanging there, crucified, beaten, mocked, spit on, hung there and said, it is finished. I saw this quote this week that really hit me. In this verse it says, it is finished. This payment, this transaction is finished. Your debt is paid. What he didn't say is that you are finished. This transaction was the beginning of a lifelong journey with you and him. What was finished was him writing his invitation for you to come home. That's what was finished. You could come home now. Luke 24, 
verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman took the spices they had prepared and went out to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Jesus was risen, and he finally accomplished the mission that he came to do, to bring you back home. Imagine this embrace that Abraham and Lot had on the battlefield behind enemy lines. Abraham hugging his nephew. You can come home now. I got you. You can come home now. Jesus is saying the same thing to you. The invitation he made is for you to come home. Wherever you may be, don't think you're too far to come home. Whatever you've done, don't think that gets in the way from you coming home. El Elyon, the God Most High, has made a way for you to come back home. This weekend, as remembering what Jesus has done for us, the resurrection that he made, I want you to also remember the choice that he gave you, the invitation that he gives you to come back home. He said, I saw you in that mess, and I couldn't live the way, I couldn't live like that. I need you by my side. I need you here with me. So come home. So as the group sings their last song, I want you to think about that invitation to come home. Jesus saw you as well. Will you come home? Lord, you did that very thing. You came back for us. Lord, you let that invitation open for us to come back home. Lord, as we remember what you've done for us this weekend, Lord, I ask that you keep that in our hearts, Lord, not just this weekend, but for the rest of our lives, Lord. The journey you took and saw us, saw us as worth it, Lord. You saw us as loved. You saw us lost and said, I can't live without you. You saw us individually, Lord. You saw the mistakes we were going to make, and still you went on the cross. And Lord, while that bill, while that debt was finished, Lord, that was the beginning of our life with you. Lord, forgive us for the sins that nailed you on that cross. And Lord, accept us, Lord. Thank you so much for this weekend where we can remember what you've done, Lord. Let us be a testimony to others, Lord. Let us carry ourselves differently and confident so that others know we serve El Elyon, Lord, the God Most High. And that's through you we can have this peace. Thank you, Lord, for this weekend. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.